Okay. We should be live. We'll just wait for Sandy to return. Or not. Whatever. Um, hey, everyone. <laughs> Picturing Fraser and the others chatting away as Fraser forgot to hit start. That's possible. No, I, I am so focused 100% of my energy on making sure the whole thing starts up. I don't think that's ever happened. I've never forgotten to press start. I fumbled around trying to figure out how to make the whole system go, but apart from that. So uh, go ahead and say hello to us in the chat. Lest we forget to say your hello to you. Uh, before the, the show, uh, Brian, what do you think? Don Archangel says, is it possible the universe isn't expanding and it just looks that way because time moved slower before? Is there a name for this idea? <laughs> um. That's a good question. I, I don't know of any theory that proposed time flowing slower before. There's something called the tired light mm -hmm. uh, theory, which is that, you know, light just uh, spontaneously gets more red. And so therefore it's not expanding. Yeah. Cause it get, just gets uh, tired. It goes too far and it just, it just gets, gets tired. tired. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. But then, mm -hmm. okay. So, so if light, if time moved differently in the past, that feels like a thing that you could still tell by like looking at light echoes and just by measuring clocks over time, right? Like we're so accurate right. now with our clocks that we can measure them changing, right? Yeah, I think part of the problem is that in relativity, if you say time moves slower relative to us. Right. And that and that has a connection to motion. So so if you so for like distance supernovas, for example, if you if you say okay, they are they are actually going at a slower rate because of that relative motion, they appear to be going at a slower rate. But if they were just going at a slower rate and not moving, the red shifts would be off. Right. So you get you get a red shift for the slower time, but you wouldn't get a, a, a cosmological red shift for the expansion. I'm going to say hello to people. Hello to Andy Cowley, Beth Johnson, David Dunn, David Fairweather, Don Archangel, uh, Ian Farkeron, Johnny J, Kevin Ayers, Kim Barron, Miss Cooper, Nancy Graziano, Nicholas B, Nifty, Nifty, that's awesome, Paranor, Rich Wilson, Arjon, Sergusi, uh, Susie Murph. Tigger 6692, Tom J. Andrews, Wayne Francis, and Zap Pen Zap Pen. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Um, Sandy, did you get that second link that I gave you about the 77 craters on Ryugu? I think you were starting to crash when that happened. I will. Well, you're going to crash again. <laughs> if you if you if your internet is unstable don't hesitate to to just drop out you look like you're in some kind of conference room no it's in my living room yeah. Razor. okay impact crater analysis 77 craters yeah okay now that now that Hibus is on its way home and they've had a chance to start to yeah, study it, I think it's going really cool. to be a bit of a slog, but they'll get here <laughs> and they'll drop off some rocks. How about that? I'm, I can't wait. It beats beats the micrograms we got last time. Yeah, and I mean everything worked this time. It was really amazing. <laughs> it was kind of shocking. There was a lot oh. of shenanigans too. It was like there was a lot of really weird. Uh, bizarre things that were thrown at the asteroid from that spacecraft. So, all right, uh, she's uh, she's frozen in time again. So, I think I'm just going to start this up. Okay. Yeah, the lower bar is hiding a bunch of the faces. It's just this mode. I apologize, but I don't want to change it. All right, uh, there's see, perfect. Oh, it's still, I still move it up a little bit. Let me see. No, that's not it. Is it that one? 
There we go. All right. Mm, there. Hopefully that'll work. Okay. Here's me. Here we go. I guess I should have my intro in a place where it doesn't look like I'm looking off to the side of the screen. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, December 4th, 2019. Happy birthday, Logan! Hello, thanks. <laughs> I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about supermassive black holes, uh, the heaviest ever, and uh, other black hole shenanigans and asteroid shenanigans. Honestly, it's a it's going to be a bit uh, bit crazy this week. Joining me this week on my screen, uh, Sandy Springman. Sandy. Howdy. Uh, we've got, uh, Brian Koberlein. Brian. Hi. Nice to see everybody. And we got, uh, Michael Roderick. Michael. Hello. Good to be back. So we do have a guest, but the guest is, uh, pre-recorded. And so, but it's a good, good episode. Uh, Dr. Becky, one of the just best science communicators on the YouTubes. She's absolutely fantastic. It's a fairly long interview. We had a great conversation. I guarantee you will absolutely uh, love the, uh, the interview. So stick around for the, for the end, but we will play that at the end. Now let's get into this week's show. But before we do, I want to give, as always, a huge thank you to everyone at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. This is the amazing community that works with us every week to choose our guests, to organize the crew, they organize the co-hosts, and really just keep the whole machine rolling. We couldn't do this without them. And if you want to be a part of this amazing group, if you want to have connections into the space industry, if you want to say that you're Fraser's executive producer, this is how it happens. Join, go to wshcrew.space. They will give you uh, really the puppet strings to then control my every waking hour. So uh, definitely join the community. Go to wshcrew.space and they'll hook you up. All the power. All right, uh, Michael, you're on my screen. What do we got? A very massive black hole that we don't think should exist. So there was a recent paper put out uh, by a group of astronomers in China who found a black hole that's about 70 times the mass of the sun orbiting a B-type star, which is about eight times the mass of the sun. And we don't really expect to have black holes that are 70 times the mass of the sun forming in these like binary star pairs. So when you have a massive star, let's say one that's like 50 times the mass of the sun, as it evolves, it will lose a lot of its mass through something called stellar winds. So you have a star which is constantly shedding its outer layers in the form of uh, what we call a wind, and it can lose a substantial amount of mass during that process. And so when it finally evolves to, well, its end, when it finally dies, the remnant that's left over should have lost a lot of mass. And so you shouldn't be expecting to see these really massive 70 solar mass uh, black holes. So it's a very unusual detection that doesn't really fit in very well with our current models of stellar evolution so we're not really sure does this imply a completely new branch of stellar evolution there's still some question about the distance of this object if the thing is actually a lot closer to us than we think it is then it can be less massive is there some error in the way that they measured the mass of this black hole there's still kind of a lot of open questions but it's the first of its kind to be this massive and we're not really sure what exactly is going on in it. Now, now of course, uh, you know, we have the stellar mass black holes, the ones with a couple of times the mass of the sun, and we have the supermassive black holes, the ones with millions, possibly more, which we might learn about today. But um, but hasn't there always been this theorized intermediate mass black holes, ones with hundreds, maybe thousands of times the mass of the sun? Isn't this the first detection of an intermediate mass black hole? And if not, why not? <laughs> So LIGO actually kind of started that whole process of finding those um, black holes, like the ones that we know about, uh, we started out with were like 10 times the mass of the sun. And then, yeah, you had the ones that were like a million times. And you had these intermediate ones that LIGO found, which were around 30 to 60. The thing about the LIGO ones is that those were formed, we think, during 
um, collisions of other black holes, so they merge to form a more massive black hole. This system does not appear to have evolved that way. So when you look at the orbital parameters of this system, you got a star in a black hole, stars orbiting that black hole, and it's very circular. And we know that if it's if you just capture a star, generally it's going to be a pretty elliptical orbit, and it's going to take a long time for that elliptical orbit to turn into a circular orbit. It can happen, but it's going to take on the order of the age of the universe. So it's not likely then that this was a captured star. It's probably formed that way. One other interesting theory they're throwing around is that there's actually two black holes in there. They're both like 20 times the mass of the sun. But again, that's not a very likely scenario either. So, I mean, what kind of star m must have been there beforehand to be able to generate, you know, to have the remnant contain 70 times the mass of the sun? Like it must have been more. <laughs> right, yeah, so a lot more massive. And um, the star that they're looking at right now, the star that you can see, um, it's, we, we would say in astronomy, it has a very high metallicity. So what that means is that there's a lot of other elements in the star other than hydrogen and helium. And yeah, I don't know why they're called metals. So there's gotta be some weird history behind that. Um, but because it has so many metals in it, then you can have a, you can start out with like a hundred, a star that's about a hundred times the mass of the sun. But again, because of that high metallicity, it implies through evolutionary theory that it should be blowing out this massive wind. And so even if you did have a very massive star, according to the current theories, you should still lose enough mass so you won't have this really massive remnant. So this, it really doesn't seem to fit in with what we know about stars. And then there's another kind, and I, I also understand as well with some of the largest stars, when they do explode as supernova, they just, they vaporize entirely. There, there is no remnant. They just go right. kaboom and that's that. And so again, you've got some massive star and yet here you are with a, with a black hole remnant. Um, Brian, the internet went a little silly with this one, the, the impossible black hole, this shouldn't happen, shouldn't be, uh, Astro Boffins are puzzled. Um, uh, how do you feel about this as a, an Astro Boffin? We're, we're always puzzled, everything's impossible, and <laughs> currently we don't know anything, you know. It's, I think it goes with the standard idea that people think that scientists in general make progress when they go, Eureka! And, and it, it's actually more accurate to say that science make progress when some scientist goes, what the heck? Um, so I think, when, uh, you know, it's not that the black holes are impossible. We just don't know how they form. I mean, it's clearly possible because they exist. It is. <laughs> and, and I think that's the, the real key is that, you know, every time we gather more information, we learn more things. Uh, we find out how to improve our models. And so when we find something odd like this, this is exciting because it allows us to, to test new ideas and come up with new ideas. One of the interesting things about this too is how it was discovered. So the, you know, again, we talked about these two populations of black holes, ones that are a few times the mass of the sun. We found those with x-rays. These uh, black holes have the microphone. Have Someone's <laughs> microphone is scraping. Okay. Yeah, it's not, it, it, it has to be used, Michael. <laughs> Everyone else is muted. All right. Well, I don't think there's anything on my yeah. laptop. Um, but, right, so we found these original black holes through x-rays. So the black holes are accreting material from a host star. That material gets really hot and it makes x-rays. And then you have the ones that are in the centers of uh, galaxies and you can look at those through motions of stars around the centers of uh, the galaxies. This one was found um, in a similar way that they find exoplanets. So you look at a star, you see the star is moving around, it's wobbling about, it's got to have some companion there. You don't see that companion, and it's a really massive companion, which means that it has to be a black hole. So this is kind of a new path that's been discovered um, for, for finding black holes. And so then, in theory, the potential is larger surveys, more methods to try and find these black holes out there, and maybe we'll find more of them, and then it'll seem entirely normal. And then 
theorists will come up with some mechanism and then they'll look for data to explain it and then it'll all be normal and uh, astronomers will no longer be puzzled. Science progresses. Science progresses, yeah. Brian, what do you got? Oh, sorry. Um, so related to the black holes, we've discovered a 40 billion solar mass black hole in a distant galaxy, which is huge. Um, you know, ours, the, the black supermassive black hole in our galaxy is only a few million solar masses. And this is 40 billion solar masses. So it's a bit bigger. <laughs> and it's the largest supermassive black hole we've found. Um, what's interesting is coming back to the idea of how black holes are found. Um, this relates to how do you know the mass of a black hole? Uh, because we can see black holes in galaxies by large jets or if they're active or something like that. But how do you figure out the mass? And if it's close, like the black hole in our galaxy, we can find it by looking at stars and how they orbit. And so as they orbit our supermassive black hole, it just plain Kepler's laws, you can figure out what the mass of the black hole is. But when they're more distant, uh, you can't, because you can't find anything orbiting. You just can't resolve any orbiting stars or anything. And so you have to use different methods. One of the ways is to look at, there's, there's a correlation between the, the size of a black hole in a galaxy and, and it's in, in some sense, it's overall brightness, what we call its brightness curve. And uh, the first one that was done in optical is the Tully-Fisher relation that looks at the relation of the two, but there's other ones as well. So, so this particular one is, is part of a large cluster and it's 600 million light years away there's no way we're going to find any orbiting stars. Um, but they looked at the bright curve. They when, when they looked at this particular galaxy, they found that it was more dark than, than typical within its central region. So it was this kind of bright galaxy with this dark region in the center. And that's exactly kind of what you would expect if there's a large black hole there. So by analyzing the light curve of this galaxy, uh, they were able to determine what the mass is. And it turns out that it's the largest black hole we've discovered so far. Is Are we getting close to, like, the limits of what's possible? Like, I know that that when we, like, we see the same kinds of structures around the entire universe that we see here. And we, we you know, we see um, galaxies... Uh, like the Milky Way and we see other galaxies in our local group. And then if we go to a larger scale, we see a, a cluster of galaxies. We can go to a larger scale. We see a super cluster, but it kind of tops out there. there. There actually is a limit to the scale of these structures. You know, at a right. certain point, they don't get any bigger. There's, right. you know, you get the walls and you get super clusters, but you don't get super cluster clusters, et cetera. There's a, there's a top limit. And so there's got to be some maximum a black hole mass that should have happened by the since the beginning of the universe based on the kind, the way the matter was clumped together. So are we closing in with a with a 40 billion mass black hole? So I'll say it as 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 an astronomer within an order of magnitude we found the largest. <laughs> right. So we could uh, be 400 billion, you know, whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. This particular black hole is is in a galaxy that's in the center of a very large supercluster. So, so this almost certainly would have been formed by merging galaxies and therefore merging black holes very quickly, you know, within the scale of the universe. Um, it's the only way you're going to get, as far as we know, those really hyper large black holes because the the size of your black hole is going to correlate with the size of your galaxy because you only have a certain amount of stuff um and so the only way to get the really 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 big ones is going to be through galactic mergers um beth johnson asks uh do we think that some of those black holes might be hidden in data that we've already collected now that we have found one, can we go back and look for more? And I think this was related to the previous question. You know, it's all black holes all the time here today. But, you know, these various techniques, do we think we can go back and, and find more out there? 
I think so. I think that's one of the actual interesting things. It's just kind of a transition in astronomy as we're doing more sky surveys. A lot of it is the data is there and it's more about mining the data than it is about making a specific observation. So, so yeah, I mean, this is the data has to have for these sky surveys. I think some of them you'd, you'd want secondary observations because doing the actual light curve of a specific galaxy and identifying it relative to something else may need its own unique observations, but certainly identifying candidates could be done within the data that we have. But aren't there, I mean, galaxy clusters are some of the biggest and brightest objects in the universe and Hubble has seen them. You're saying this one has been seen out to 600 plus million. 600 million years, I think. Right. 600 million uh, light years, light years. yeah but when you think about some of the observations that hubble has made that's nothing i mean it's it can directly look out to 5 billion light years ish it can it can use gravitational lensing to go out to 500 million years after the big bang so it feels like it sh why if we can see more galaxy clusters out there why have has this relatively close one been identified as the heaviest one? Wouldn't you expect, sort of just by seeing a bigger galaxy cluster out there, you'd assume there's a bigger black hole in there? Not necessarily. I mean, part of part of the thing that we have is that the farther back, the farther in distance you're doing, you're, you're further back in time. And so these mergers mm. that take time to occur, you know, are, in some sense, you'd almost expect the largest ones to be somewhat closer to us than billions and billions of light years away because they're, they're older galaxies that we're seeing closer to us, uh, particularly with large clusters. They've had more time to form than a large cluster, you know, that's right. billions of light years away. Yeah, people always ask me like, you know, Andromeda is on its way to collide with us and you know, and it's whatever, two and a half million light years away. And it's so when we look at it, isn't it actually a lot closer than we look at? But in fact, uh, in two and a half million years, it only moves, say, a thousand light years. Um, right. So it's actually not that much closer. But in this case, when you look at stuff that are five billion light years away, 10 billion light years away, they're much different today than they were when we were looking at them. We we're looking. At right. Those, those you know, days. there's a difference between the order of a million years and the order of a billion years. Yeah. You know, it's it's, it's like, you know, a, a billion light years is about a billion light years farther than a million light years. <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome. Uh, Sandy. Hello. Today is uh, crater counting on Ryugu, the target of the Hayabusa 2 mission. And the Hayabusa 2 mission has left Hay uh, Ryugu, and it's going to come home with sample for scientists to study in the next couple of years. How is it doing? Because, I mean, we saw all the ups and downs with the original Hayabusa mission, and it was on the one hand, incredibly frustrating, but on the other hand, quite amazing what they were able to pull off and able to bring back a sad, disappointing amount of material from, from another asteroid. Uh, when you compare that to- Cures and impactors and yeah. cameras. Yeah, so with Hayabusa 2, like what were they, how, how did it all go? It went great. Um, things seemed to have worked. Uh, the kinetic impactor seems to have worked. They got sample like they intended rather than sort of accidentally with Hayabusa 1. Uh, when you fly the original, you refly an original spacecraft design and sort of update it to add new things, you're taking all the risk of the original mission and you're adding on additional risks. And so, you know, some people would have just designed something from scratch rather than make something that was inherently more risky. But due to a lot of planning and a lot of um, hard work, the Japanese were able to be successful with this mission. And so and, they were able to count craters on on yeah, they Reagan. found what did they seventy seven big impact craters. Um, uh, I'm, I'm so showing the found... picture beside your face right now, so people can actually see the uh, all the different impact craters. They are hard to real. I mean, now that I actually look at some of these pictures, you definitely can see that they are. They look. They have that sort of shape, but they are definitely more subtle than what you would see as an impact crater on something like the moon. So why is that? Uh, because this asteroid doesn't have anywhere near the uh, 
the structural integrity that the moon has. It's made sort of more out of uh, popcorn or gravel barely stuck together with <laughs> um, cohesive forces, unlike the moon, which has enough gravity to pull it into a big solid rock. And so what would be like, what would happen? I mean, I'm sort of, I'm kind of imagining um, some impactor smashing into, into Ryugu. I mean, it's a fairly small, like how big is Ryugu? I think it's about a kilometer. Okay. Um, it's not huge. Yeah. Cause those, uh, um, venue is about half a kilometer. So it's on the, the order of a kilometer, but you're still talking more about impact. It's more like hitting things with styrofoam, hitting styrofoam. Right. Than it would be hitting rock. Hitting a, hitting a, a, a pile of styrofoam, tiny yeah. little styrofoam balls. <laughs> and because things aren't really that, uh, the, because the material doesn't have a lot of strength, it's able to absorb impacts a little better. And so what would happen? Like if you got, you know, if you got one of these impacts, um, if I it was to too extent, hard, would it just like explode can, the whole thing and then it would yeah. have to reform and then the, then the whole object would come back together again? Yeah, ish. <laughs> I'm, I think I yeah. think that's a very reasonable explanation. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of imagining like like I know that that planetary scientists when they are are trying to map out the age of regions on places like the Moon or Mars, they count craters and they go they see like a big crater and then that big crater has some smaller craters inside of it and the number of craters that they see that tells them when you know, how old a certain chunk of landscape is and when the lava flows happened, sorry, lava flows happened. Um, but but I sort of imagine, I mean, in this situation, you, you're you going to be pressing the reset button every now and then on the entire object as this pile of gravel comes apart and then just sort of comes back to comes back together again. Yeah. Well, they also found um, looking at the shape of Ryugu that there seems to be this sort of fossil ridge going over um, part of the asteroid. Uh, and so it looks like that used to be a ridge that was at the equator of this asteroid, but then um, the asteroid changed where it points its rotation. So uh, this ridge must have formed when the asteroid was rotating more quickly. And so you can this ridge that you see in the Eastern Hemisphere is sort of a relic of a past rotation state of Ryugu. So what happens next with Hayabusa? It comes back, it brings back some samples and people get to study them in a few years. So you can figure out where this asteroid formed, uh, sort of more the, the microscopic, how do you go from microscopic information and how do you say something about the more macro history of this asteroid as a whole? And since they sampled in different locations, they're going to have different types of sample to analyze as well, which is exciting. Um, so, oh, go ahead, Michael. Uh, I remember part of this mission was they had those little uh, like circular robots that they dropped down on the asteroid and they kind of like hopped around. Are those, uh, are those like completely shut off? Do they just last for like, you know, an hour or so? They, Do you know if they're still going? I, I, well, there's not going to be any way to get data home once. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Two I left. think they were just battery powered. So yeah. they wrapped up. It'd be pretty up. cool if you go back to the asteroid in a few years. Um, and I think that like the, yeah, it'd be amazing to go back and actually see the, whatever still remains on the surface of the of the world and see how they've been how they've been weathered down over time if you can go back and and visit with them mm -hmm. um now now with we mentioned this a bit like with the first high boost emission you know they only got a couple of micrograms back that they're able to study with this they were able to actually get samples from more from the interior of of Ryugu. what does that what would new, seeing more from the interior of it tell scientists? Well, hopefully material that has spent less time on the surface of the asteroid has been less impacted by cosmic rays. Maybe it hasn't been heated as much. Maybe it hasn't been impacted by micrometeor micrometeorite bombardment. Uh, so that hopefully material further under the surface is more quote unquote pristine and hasn't undergone as much processing since this asteroid, you know, over the, the age of the material on the surface of the asteroid, which is like, what, you know, a few billion years. Yeah. Um, uh, so the idea is to bring back material that has undergone the least amount of evolution so that you can say something more coherent about the asteroid as a whole. 
I mean, one of the you... things that's, that's really fascinating me about this and as well as what they had with Bennu is just the amount of water that they're starting to discover on these yeah. objects. They're surprisingly damp <laughs> compared <laughs> to, I think, what everybody expected was that they'd be dry as a bone, which is good news for, yeah. uh, you know, helping to understand where water might have come from in the early in the early solar system and even resources for further exploring the solar system. I can't wait to see what happens. Yeah, so 2021 is probably when people will start analyzing the samples. And they'll be glad to ha be able to have it on the order of, you know, hundreds of grams as opposed to micrograms. But it's, a, it's actually incredible how much they figured out even from the original samples from the original Hayabusa mission. It's still a, quite a work of, uh, of science. All right. Well, we're going to shift in a moment over to this week's interview. But before we do, I want to uh, give each of my uh, co-hosts a chance to let me know what they're working on uh, before they before they uh, leave and I continue on with the rest of the show. Um, and I got a question from uh, from Nancy for you, uh, Brian. Uh, do you have any update on the Big Science Sizzle Reel? So, so the Big Science Sizzle Reel is the Big Science Show has been pitched to, I guess, a, a a large network. I can't name the network. Um, feedback that I've heard so far is tentatively positive. Good. I have heard nothing beyond Fine. that. That's. So no, no other information. Well, then what else are you working on? I, uh, you can find me at universe today sometimes, and you can find me on my Perhaps website, which tomorrow. is Brian. Yeah. And then BrianCoverline.com, where you can find other things. Um, and, and what is, what I'm doing right and now. what is something recently you actually did a, did a, an article about this, uh, the fifth force for us. Yeah. The possible today. fifth force that you could detect with, uh, you know, particle physics. So check long? it out on Universe today, um, and uh, I'll have some other interesting ones this month. So it sounds good, uh, Michael. What are you working on? So we've got a Astronomy on Tap show coming up on Monday. So we're going to be talking about the Swiss satellite, which is actually operated at Penn State. So we've got two Swiss scientists who are going to be giving us talks about how the satellite works and what kind of science you can do with it. Wait, which which Swiss satellite? Uh, the the Swiss satellite. Sw the swift yeah it's, okay. it's not an acronym it's actually just called swift because right. it's uh named it can after turn very quickly yeah um and so it looks for gamma ray bursts or x-rays and it also has like a uv optical telescope on it so you can do actual like, yeah. regular astronomy with it too so it should be pretty good sandy what are you up to i'm trying to convince the cat to come over here yeah you promised Jeez. us a cat I did not promise you a cat. I promised an attempt at a cat. Right. She, her name's Princess Tiny Feet, and she's growing into the first part of her name every day. Um, I'm still at Sandy on Twitter, and I'm still at Sandy.com, but really I'm trying to graduate, which I'm, I should be working harder. <laughs> when do we get to call you doctor? Uh, whenever they give me the degree. <laughs> You ask smart, smart ass questions, Fraser. You're gonna get smart ass answers. That's true. I I understand the risks. Um, all right. So uh, thank you to uh, to all of my co-hosts. I'm going to uh, bid them adieu. Um, but and then we're gonna move on to the actual special guest, which is Dr. Becky. And again, uh, fantastic interview. I really enjoyed it. So um, definitely stick around. But thanks. I'm gonna say we'll put everyone on the screen here, just so that we can all wave goodbye. Uh, and then uh, we'll move on to the next portion. So thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to the interview. So I'm going to make this work. Here it goes. Videos on YouTube, too, uh, with an unnatural oh. level of enthusiasm. You can hear her. All right. And our guest today for the Weekly Space Hangout is Dr. Becky. Dr. Becky, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Uh, who are you? What do you do? Uh, so I am an astrophysicist at the University of Oxford. Uh, I research supermassive black holes and their effects on galaxies. And I also make videos on YouTube, too, uh, with an unnatural level of enthusiasm, I've been told. <laughs> An unnatural level of enthusiasm? 
an unnatural yeah I, i'm taking it as a compliment <laughs> yeah totally you totally should i've i've been uh also accused of something fairly similar which is like how do you just get so excited about this stuff because i mean how do you not um exactly that's my own response as well like yeah. how can you not like yeah. stare at the sky and just be like wow <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so let's so let's talk about your work first. Um, supermassive black holes, specifically. Um, what are some objects that you are studying? Oh, so um, I study well black holes in most galaxies. Actually, I do what's called um, a population study. So it's all about like big data science, like what people like to talk about these days. So as many galaxies as I can get my hands on, specifically with growing supermassive black holes. So that's one side, but then I also look at um, these galaxies that I like to call sort of like egg white omelets. Okay, <laughs> so um, you know how galaxies kind of like beautiful spiral galaxies will have that spiral structure and then they'll have like a, a blob in the center. It's kind of like the egg yolk of a fried egg. Um, and so I study black holes in galaxies that don't have that, the yolk. So they're an egg white omelet. They're just sort of like flat and they're pure spiral galaxies. And we think that those are galaxies that haven't had mergers. So a merger with oh. another galaxy that's come in. So a merger of a galaxy will force stars to the center and it will build that big bulge or yolk. But by doing that, it forces a lot of other material to the center, which can also grow your black hole that's in the very center, these supermassive black holes. And so my work is like, well, in galaxies that haven't had a merger, then how big is the black hole? Right, and it I turns see. out they can be just as big, uh, but without having had a merger. And so there's, we've kind of had this little paradigm shift in how we think black holes grow, which is kind of awesome. Well, and the, I mean, the, the mechanisms for these growing black holes is they get a chance to feed on materials, but they also smash into each other and merge together. And when you get those galaxy collisions, multiple black holes come together. And so you're finding that, that no matter what, these things are growing about the same speed, whether or not they're merging. What? Exactly. Yeah. So somehow we think that the spiral arms or sometimes there's like a, a bar in the center of the galaxy as well, that the spiral arms come out of that can like funnel gas into the center. And the thing is, that's a really calm process. And it's because the material is all coming in from the same direction all the time. It actually means that the black hole taking in that material is much more efficient. Whereas when the black holes all crash together, it actually isn't very efficient at all. Even though it's sort of you're like doubling your black hole mass, you can actually do it just as quick with this really calm, efficient process instead. And so one of the big outstanding mysteries in astronomy is this question about whether the supermassive black holes or the galaxies form, you know, speaking of, of eggs and omelets, which came first. Do you, do you feel like, like you guys are starting to crack that one and have an answer yet? Yeah, um, so I actually wrote a chapter about this in my book that came out recently, at least in the UK anyway. Um, it, the original chicken of the egg, like you say. Yeah. <laughs> um, what came first, the galaxy of the black hole? And I'm definitely in the camp of the black hole came first. So the question is whether the, the galaxy of stars formed, one star went supernova, became a black hole, became the heaviest thing, so sank to the very center and it grew from there, or whether the black hole formed first in the very, very early universe out of just pure hydrogen gas collapsing down and then a galaxy of stars formed around it. And so when we look in, in simulations about how quick it takes us to grow a black hole from sort of supernova and up to maybe like millions of times the mass of the sun, it takes something like over a billion years, for example. And the problem is that we found black holes that big in the universe when the universe was much younger than that at say 800 million years old and so the only way we can reconcile that is to say well the black hole must be a lot bigger when it first forms it can't be something like three times the mass of the sun like what you get out of a supernova it's got to be something like ten thousand times the mass of the sun uh in what we call a direct collapse black hole right which and is a really cool word <laughs> yeah well i know that like Today, all the stars are so polluted that they, um, you know, there's a limit to the, to the mass of the black hole that you can form. They, you know, they'll, they'll stop allowing matter to inflow and then they, they'll detonate as a supernova and you, you know, a couple of hundred times the mass of the sun at, at the most. 
but maybe at the beginning of the universe, the stars could be a lot bigger. But, you know, I had heard in the hundreds of times the still hundreds of times the mass of the sun, but you're thinking maybe tens of thousands of times the mass of the sun in one yeah. big supernova. So it wouldn't even be a supernova. You would just skip star entirely. So you'd have this huge cloud of hydrogen gas that would possibly be like irradiated by some other stars that had formed over here. And it was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and just not being allowed to collapse down into a star because the molecules in it were so hot. You have to have cold gas to make a star, weirdly, because they have to be able to collapse under gravity. But if you're just collecting more and more gas in that same spot, eventually you're going to reach the point where you've got too much mass in one place and you just completely skip star entirely and it collapses down into something that's like tens of thousands of times the mass of the sun. So it's sort of like a, a jump start on your black hole. And so you would at least that's the theory. <laughs> right, right, right. And so you wouldn't get a supernova. And so these things wouldn't be bright and easy to see. No, exactly. There is something that we've spotted with the Hubble Space Telescope that's incredibly, incredibly distant. It's sort of one of the earliest things you've seen in the universe. And it's incredibly bright, but doesn't have the signatures of what you'd expect from something that has stars in it. And so the assumption is that it's one of these incredibly bright clouds of gas that's being irradiated by other stars and stopped from collapsing that will eventually turn into a black hole. Um, but that's the only evidence we have for that hypothesis at the minute is that one detection that we've made with the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's a really interesting idea. And it's one that theorists have probably accepted and one that simulation people have accepted. But we're <laughs> observationally, we've only got one data point. Right. One data point <laughs> does right. not make a theory, right? And that, and that sounds to me like you probably got it through some kind of gravitational lens with Hubble. Like it's some kind of bank shot using the ga the gravity of a galaxy cluster to be able to make this observation you know, um, yeah. you know we don't know what dark matter is but it makes a handy telescope um <laughs> exactly. but um but maybe i mean actually someone asked me a question uh, earlier this week about james webb will james webb be able to do these kinds of gravitational lensing and maybe that'll be the two i mean it's going to be able to see the kinds of things that hubble could see but directly it won't need to use the gravitational lenses, but then it will also probably be able to take advantage of gravitational lenses to go even farther. Yeah, so James Webb is uh, just the hopes of most fields of astronomy rest on it at the moment. Um, so <laughs> it explore. will be able yeah, it, <laughs> it will be able to see much further than Hubble because it's infrared James Webb. And that's very exciting. It won't produce as many pretty pictures as Hubble did, unfortunately. Um, but it can see further because of it, because a lot of the light from very distant objects in the universe has actually been completely redshifted out of the optical part of the spectrum that we can see with Hubble. And so James Webb will actually be able to detect more distant things because it can still detect the infrared light that it's given off as normal light and then has been redshifted on its way to us. So it's really interesting that Yes, we'll still be able to use it and, and spot things in gravitational lenses, but in the infrared as you know, rather than the optical, but also that we'll be able to actually detect, you know, direct light from it that's not been lensed at all as well. So, yeah, James Webb is kind of awesome that it can do both the very, very distant things in the universe and then also atmospheres of exoplanets that are only like a hop skip across the universe yeah. in comparison. So uh, the other part that I wanted to talk to you about was your YouTube channel. Um, as a fellow YouTuber, I understand the, the, the journey that you go through. Um, now, you had sort of originally been guest starring in other people's YouTube channels. Mm -hmm. And when did you decide to hit the, hit the road and do your own as well? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I don't know whether it was a conscious decision necessarily. Um, so I did a lot for 60 Symbols yeah. and Deep Sky videos, which are some of Brady Haran's channels. And that was because I was actually hired by the University of Nottingham to be an independent researcher who also makes YouTube videos, which is kind of awesome. So the, um, like, the job application was like a CV a uh, an A4 side, like summarizing the research you want to do, and then a two minute video on something in physics which is kind of the weirdest job application probably ever. Um, but when that job unfortunately came to an end, because it was only a two-year position, which most sort of fresh out of your PhD 
you know, doing research, those are sort of two to three year positions that you get. So I had to apply for another job. Uh, and so I moved um, to Oxford for three to four years, which I've been here a year now. And unfortunately, because I was no longer at Nottingham, I couldn't contribute to their YouTube channel, 60 Symbols, because it's funded by Nottingham. It's sort of like a politics thing, I guess. Right. So I was kind of sad. And I was like, I don't not want to do YouTube anymore. So I was like, I'll just, I'll just make my own. <laughs> and then here we are a year later, and it, I'm just making a video every week, and, it, and it's doing really well. So. Yeah, no, you're doing fantastic. I'm really enjoying uh, your work. Um, and I guess, but it, but now you have to do all the other stuff too, the editing and the writing and the concepts and the so on yeah, and so forth. Yeah, and I didn't want that to hold me back though because I was like, I don't really know how to edit. I don't know much about audio or cameras or anything when I started and I didn't want that to hold me back. I was just like, just start and you'll learn it on the job. And people were really quite helpful in the comments being like, oh, try this, it'll help. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, great, that will help. And I, I literally learned over the past, over the first like six months, I'm still learning now yeah. how to do stuff. Yeah, I think the we're at 400 favorite. episodes of The Guide to Space so far, 420 something. Anyway, I'm definitely still learning every single time, right? Like this yeah. will never end, so. Yeah, that's what I love about YouTube though, is that you don't go for it for the super overproduced, you know, documentaries that, you know, the BBC or whatever make. You you go for it to to, to connect like this, right? Yeah. With, you know, researchers through your screen and have a chat, which is great. It's interesting though, I mean, that you were hired originally and the YouTube was part of the or like making informational mm -hmm. videos was part of it. I mean, I've, I've had a chance to talk to a lot of, of folks in the United States and the theme that I really get in the US is that the ability to communicate this stuff to the public is, is actually not that interesting to universities. They're not that, uh, they don't really care. Uh, do you find that that's similar in, in Europe, in, in the UK, or is, it, or is there more of an emphasis on this? I think, I mean, I only have experience with the UK. I've only ever worked in the UK, so I can't really speak for Europe as a whole. But in the UK, I think universities really care. I think they really understand that we are funded by taxpayer money. So my PhD was funded by the Science Technology Facilities Council, which is like the NSA in the States. And that's funded by taxpayers. And so if you don't communicate your ideas back to those people who have literally paid for you to get this, degree and to to become this expert and I don't really see why you what you're in it for because you know when we the the model obviously of science is that you write this big journal article that gets posted and let's be honest even I will struggle to read some astronomy papers because the jargon is just really like you know <laughs> they're not written for the public yeah and there's this barrier to entry and I hate that like I wish that papers were written for everybody yeah. Because that's the way of communicating science that we have at the minute. Some are starting to do that. It's not good. Yeah, like I've noticed mm. that some will actually write, they're required to write uh, several paragraphs in layman's terms that we can all try to understand what the the gist of the paper to understand what's the interesting thing for science. I have the same problem, right? Like I'm I'm I go through Astro PH every day looking for interesting stories to report on because that's you know that's where the good stuff is. And um I, I find that a lot of it if I'm if I'm if I don't go slowly and go, okay, reionization of H you know, hydrogen alpha at the you know, lime and forest. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. What is, what is, oh, okay, I understand. And then move on, right? That I have to yeah, go Yeah, you shouldn't have to remind yourself of a concept every two <laughs> words. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. That, and and a lot of times it's funny because then you look at, say, all these universities will have press offices and they're putting out press releases. But if, if someone does a really interesting piece of research and it doesn't happen to get picked up by the press officer, then that information is just, you know, maybe it makes its rounds in the academic community, but for the regular public, they don't find out about this really fascinating research that's going on just for whatever mm -hmm. whims. And that just seems like there's this gigantic disconnect, right? Mm -hmm. Why have a public relations effort at all if you're not interested yeah. in getting this information out to the public? You're paying for it. Yeah. Why not communicate it? We're ready. There's, We're actually, there's actually a button that you can tick when you submit a paper to, paper to a journal that says, are you planning to do a press release with this? And if you don't tick it, 
then but you, it won't get to the press. And that's why I, like, I love like sites like you're up with Universe Today is so great because you actually do troll through archive and find the ones. Like I saw that you'd picked up on that paper where there's like three supermassive yeah. black holes that have been found in the center of a galaxy. And I was like, I know I've just been reading that and getting so excited and thinking, why isn't this on like the mainstream news? You know, so it, it's good that, you know, it shouldn't be on your shoulders or yeah. my shoulders to do that but it's good that you do it yeah it's it's it is tough and you can see i mean you know when i started there were dedicated beat reporters at different at different like at cnn and msnbc there was a there was a science and a space journalist at each one of these places would attend launches and write about the different discoveries and they all got laid off and so mm -hmm. there are no really, unless I, I can't think of any dedicated, I think the Houston Chronicle, I think has someone on the space beat. And apart from that, there's a bunch of people at various web agencies, but apart from that, there really is, and no one is specializing. And so, and so they're either writing and, and trying to communicate this stuff, but they don't really understand what it is that they're looking at. And that's why I think the work that you're doing is so important because you are a trained astrophysicist who can, you know, understand and communicate this stuff out, out to the public. Um, so what I are like some... I think of myself as someone on the inside. <laughs> someone on the inside, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so what are, you know, I was actually going to ask you about the, the three supermassive black hole story. What are some other stories right now that are, that you're following that you're finding really interesting? Mm, um, the one that uh, comes to mind straight away is the crisis in cosmology paper that came out two weeks ago. Um, mm -hmm. And just generally, the, none of the methods for measuring the age of the universe currently agree. Uh, and that's a big issue. Um, the paper that came out two weeks ago was like, maybe if we reanalyze the cosmic microwave background data, the echo from the Big Bang differently, it will reconcile. But it got so much worse <laughs> that now there's this sort of like, oh, actually, maybe there's something wrong with the data, or maybe there's some new physics. Obviously, new physics would be the one we'd want. But of course, we have to maybe consider the fact that there's something wrong with the data and then maybe even consider the fact that we need new models of the universe. Um, and that could be a big thing, you know, sort of going back to the drawing board almost. It's funny. Um, so that's me, something that I'm really following. Well, it's funny to me how astrophysicists that I talk to about this are, you know, it's called a crisis in cosmology. And it is and and the gist is that a bunch of people are wrong and they couldn't be happier. Like it's yeah. so, it's so funny to me how much these astrophysicists are enjoying the possibility that they're wrong yeah. because this means there's just entirely new areas to figure out, new theories to test yeah. out. Like it's just, uh, it's one of the wonderful things about science is just that yeah. they, scientists love to find out that they didn't understand something in the level of detail that it turns out to be. Yeah, I don't know if you find this, but when I talk about the fact that we don't understand something on my channel, I get a lot of comments that are like, oh, scientists yeah. think they know everything, they clearly don't. Yeah. Look at them just guessing in the dark again. And it's like, it, it, if we knew everything already, it would be really boring. Of course we don't know everything. The assumption that we as humans should understand the entire universe is baffles me. Like, I don't expect to, you know, ever, for us to ever understand everything in the universe because why should we like we you know it's kind of arrogant to assume or expect that we could um and so i'm just kind of like yeah of course our models could be wrong and that's the the big thing about science is not being so attached to an idea that you would never want to change it right so we're working with the best that we've got at the minute and of course stuff is always going to change as, as science moves on so. yeah well, I'll uh, run out of time. Uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. If people want to find out more about what you do, where can they go? Uh, they can go to Twitter, Dr. Becky with an underscore at the end, or Instagram, Dr. Becky underscore S, or my YouTube channel, Dr. Becky. And we'll definitely put a link to all of those in the show notes. Uh, Dr. Becky, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today, and uh, we'll see you on YouTube. See you on YouTube. Bye.